manner than that. So um, I'll give a brief introduction and then what I really want to go over is roadmap because I think it's really interesting for everyone to know, you know, you hear a lot about Moore's Law um, and of course Intel's the, uh, um, you know, the flag bearer for Moore's Law, but most people don't actually know what Moore's Law is. Um, so I, th I think it's very interesting to have a look at what that is and why it's important for the industry. Um, the other thing, and then I'm going to move on to FinFETs, and then I'll talk about um, the technology that uh, we work at at uh, my startup company, which is uh, DDC or the Deeply Pleated uh, Channel Transistor, and then I'll wrap it up. So I'm not sure if this is interactive with questions or it's, yeah, it's, it's a lecture. All right, so I, if you guys have questions, just stop and just ask questions. As I've, I've got no, no problem being interrupted. All right, so if we look at the road, uh, if we look at the roadmap, everyone talks about scaling. What is scaling? Okay, and people go, it's Moore's law. Well, scaling is you know part of Moore's law is scaling, but there's more to Moore's law than just scaling. So when I think about scaling, and again, you speak to different people, they'll give you, slight, they'll give you slightly different uh, interpretations of it. I think of scaling as basically the physical scaling of a transistor. So um, what are you scaling? You're scaling the gate length. Um, and uh, you know, when you scale the gate length, it comes with a whole bunch of things. You have much less gate capacitance, um, which gives you high performance. And then also you're trying to squeeze the, what, what's known as the poly pitch and the metal pitch. So if you don't scale your gate length, well then there's no ways you can scale the rest of the device because you have to contact the device somewhere. So length, so, so LG or gate scaling is very important. Um, and then the other two things are the smaller gate width and then the gate pitch. So you hear about a 50% shrink in active size each year. Where it comes from is you get a 0.7 scale in the width of the transistor and you get a 0.7 scale in the um, poly pitch of the transistor and then you multiply those together, 0 0.7, 0 0.7 gives you 50% area scaling. Um, now the interesting thing about width scaling, which I'll get into later when I speak about FinFETs, is width scaling also brings with it a, almost an automatic power, uh, power savings. And you can think about this very simply as if I've got a transistor which is one micron wide and I'm dry, driving it at you know, one milliamp per micron, well then the power that's being dissipated through that is VI. And it's not per micron, it's the actual real current. So if I then halve the width of the device, I've essentially halved the amount of current that I'm driving through um, the circuit, so therefore my power goes down. So it's not just about making it smaller, it's also, um, it reduces power um, and, it and it allows you to fit more into the silicon. Um, the other two components to scaling that are very important are the thinner tox, of course, for um, CMOS, that's very, uh, that's very important. And what that, as you thin the tox, of course, you guys have, you know, your graduate students, so you know, you get more gate capacitance, you get more control, you're able to control the short channel effects. It leads into being able to reduce the LG. Um, and then the other one is supply voltage. Now, historically, if you have a look, you don't have to go back too far. Um, when you had supply voltages that were five volts, right? And then they came down to 3.3 and, and, and 1.8. And I'll show a graph a little later on that shows that that too has saturated. Um, so then the question is, is scaling and Moore's law the same thing? And it's a yes and no um, answer to that. And uh, the linkage there is that in order for Moore's law to work, you have to have the area scaling. But there's, there is another twist to that. And that twist is basically the cost. Okay, so um, people often misuse Moore's law as some type of technological law. It's not actually a technological law. If you read uh, the original paper by Moore, it's actually a financial law. It's not even a law, it's an observation. And this is a quote from their paper. It's the complexity for minimum component costs has increased at a rate of roughly a factor of two per year. So what he's basically saying here is for the same functionality, it costs half as much every two years. Okay, and that's the key. If you're able to get the same functionality for half the cost, then essentially what happens is computing will become ubiquitous, right? Eventually it just becomes so cheap that, you know, I've got a phone in my pocket which is more powerful than a PC from 20 years ago which costs 10 times less. Um, so the question is, you know, if you look at Intel, they keep claiming Moore's Law, Moore's Law, we're winning, it's, you know, we're still on track, but really I, I'm a numbers guy, so the question is how are we doing on Moore's Law? And um, here what I have 
plotted over here is the cost per million gates. So what you can think of this is, is the cost for every transistor that you put on um, a die. And what you can see is Moore's law, I, I didn't have any data, the data going back, but it's essentially the same thing. You can see that Moore's law was definitely working down to about the 28 nanometer node. And then what happens is the cost per, tra the cost per transistor starts to go up. So this, is, this means that the 20 nanometer node, that Moore's law is broken. And the reason behind this is mainly to do with lithography. So lithography by far, if you're in a fab, Lithography is by far the most expensive processing step you'll go, you, you will go through. And right now the state of the art lithography is basically the um, immersion. And uh, as you know, um, I'm sure someone else will come in here and talk about EUV. It's not my area of expertise. Oh, he has? Yeah. Same to Vukuma? Yeah. Okay. All right. So you guys have heard the whole spiel about um, basically EUV. Uh, and. Um, what happens here is, you know, in order to get these fins which are 10 nanometers wide, you have to use multiple patterning. So before it was just you ran these things once, now people are talking about double patterning and even still, you know, at 14 nanometers there's some talk about Intel having to do triple patterning. So you can see over here that the number of immersion mass steps basically is increasing rapidly and that's what's causing the price of the transistor to increase. So what is the consequence of this? Well, the consequence of this is if you had a product at 28 nanometers and you had the exact same functionality on 20, it would actually cost you a little more. So what's the reason in going there? Well, the reason in going there would be if there was a power gain or a performance gain, et cetera, et cetera, but the cost has left the building now. So the question then is how, how are we basically doing on scaling? So. Um, What's interesting is when the, when, when the industry hit about the 130 node, there was a whole slew of papers, some of them actually from Intel, um, with people claiming that uh, scaling had stopped. There was no more scaling to be had. And the reason why people basically were making those comments was because TOC scaling had basically, you know, you couldn't scale basic silicon dioxide anymore. And with the gate length, you know, because you couldn't scale that and the short channel effects, you, you couldn't basically make LG smaller. So people were claiming scaling has stopped. And I, you know, I, 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 I make the claim, I think, somewhere in this presentation that scaling began to, that begins to break down at about the 130 node. I'm not saying it's destroyed, but it definitely begins to show signs of, prob you know, there's definitely problems there. So if you have a look at what's happened, I think it's very interesting to break out which technologies and which innovations basically moved the industry ahead. So once you hit 130, there's really no change in tox, right? So you don't get the additional gate charge you need. So if you don't have the gate charge and you want to drive more current, well then the only thing really left is mobility, right? And that's where stress comes in. So Intel introduced stress at 90, the rest of the industry introduced it at about 65, some of them at 45. And basically what stress did was stress gave two to three more nodes of scaling by the ability to basically increase the mobility. It also improved um, the external resistance. So contacting transistors has become a big issue these days because the actual contact size, I mean, if you think about um, how small these devices are, you've got contacts to the source and the drain, which are sometimes, you know, at advanced technologies are like 10, 12 nanometers wide. That's not a very large contact, right? So you get current crowding at that point of, you know, at that contact, and you actually cannot get um, the electrons in and out of the device. So the resource drains and the pre-doped epi structures that I'm sure you've seen, you know, from Intel and TSMC and the likes, basically gave, gave you not only the mobility you needed, but also reduced the R, the, R, the R external. But really, scaling didn't happen. During this whole time with stress, there was really no addition um, of making tox thinner. Um, there was some gate length scaling, but interestingly enough, most of the gate length scaling came from the fact that because you had improved mobility, you could pull your source drains back a lot more, and you also had pre-doped epi in the, a, in the PMOS, so your short channel effects did actually improve a lot. And then we get to a point at about the 65, and you're Intel, and you're basically looking at 45, and you go, okay, I need something more. I've kind of run out of stress, has got me two or three nodes. What do I do now? And that's when they introduced high K. And the interesting thing with high K is, 
you can see it over here. Now, now keep in mind this plot is kind of um, you know an average over the whole industry, right? I mean, some people are going to be you know 1.2 nanometers, others will be 1.1, but it, it's 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 generally right um, if you look at the entire industry. And what you can see is introduction of high K basically gave a quick punch, but then it kind of leveled out again. And the reason for it, if, if you have a look at a modern high K stack, it's not just high K that you have there, right? You've got an underlayer of silicon dioxide, which is about six to seven angstroms. Now, the reason why you need that silicon dioxide and you'll never get rid of it is because when you put high K directly on top of silicon, you have a very strong coupling. It's a polar optical coupling. So you have, basically, you have um, the atoms in the dielectric oscillating very quickly, and then the silicon ones oscillating not as quickly, and that sets up what's called a dipole. And there's interaction with the dipole, and it kills your mobility. So you, you actually, it actually turns out to be quite fortuitous, because it's, it's very hard not to grow oxide on silicon. It loves to oxidize. And it, tur it turns out that, you know, you put about six or seven in, um, about six or seven angstroms between the high K and the silicon, and that's enough to screen the mobility interaction. You're good to go. But you can never get rid of that, right? So that automatically, if I don't put anything else on top of that, I know that my tox is going to be, at best, 0.7 nanometers, you know, seven angstroms. So there's almost a bottom limit to, to CMOS technology on how thin I can actually make it without destroying the mobility of the channel. Then the question gets asked, well, why don't you just keep going to higher and higher K here? You know, if, if, if hefnium oxide of 20 or 22 is good, why don't you go to something of 50 or 100? And these type of materials do exist. If you look at DRAMs, the um, dielectrics that they use in DRAMs are extremely high. And the reason for this is, is actually, um, I'm not sure if you guys heard of a, of a term called fibble. So, so what fibble is, it's field-induced barrier lowering. And what happens is when you have a very high K material, it allows the electric field lines to propagate from the source to the drain. And the results are almost identical to double. I'm sure you guys have all heard of double, right? So it turns out you can't just arbitrarily go put in this, you know, four nanometer layer of 3000 epsilon, you know, high K because your device just won't work. And that's why hefnium dioxide is now in its third generation because you actually, it's, it's, you can't go, you know, any lower than that and you're not really high K anymore and any higher than that and you're going to have all these problems with fibble and, you know, feel, especially with short channel devices. So the high K was kind of like a one, you know, a one, uh, a one node kick and it kind of scaled out. And then Intel basically from 45 to 32, Intel essentially did a shrink. There was nothing really major there. They did introduce um, EPI on the NMOS device in the source drain, um, just for the raised part for um, the external resistance and short, short channel effect. And then of course they moved to FinFET. Um, so what you can see here is that if you look at traditional scaling, you know, it was going gangbusters and now it kind of leveled out and there was innovation needed and then, you know, got its one or two more generations and then more innovation, one or two more generations, now we had FinFET. And the question then is, well, how far can FinFET go? And that's what I hope to get to later. Um, the other thing which is very important is um, source voltage scaling. Okay, so the holy grail right now is to have a technology that will run at half a volt. Okay, and why is that? Well, it's quite simple. N everyone in this room has probably got a smartphone and a tablet, okay? What's more important is that your tablet's 20% faster or that you can use it for 20 hours instead of 10 hours, okay? So power has become very important. And if you look at um, what active power is in a circuit, it's basically CV squared F. C is the total capacitance. So it's basically the gate capacitance, the parasitic capacitance, and then the metal capacitance. Um, v is your applied voltage, and F is the frequency that you run chips at. Now, Intel ran into this problem at 90 nanometer node, right? They basically came out, it was Prescott, and they were like, hey, we're going to run this thing at 10 gigahertz. Sure, you can run it at 10 gigahertz, but the thing would cook eggs at 10 gigahertz. So it was a complete flop because they didn't take into account that just because you can go to higher velocity, um, higher frequencies doesn't mean that anyone's going to use them. At some point in time it just gets too hot for anyone to actually want to use it. So what's happened here is that VDD scale, 
VD scaling has essentially stopped, and it's been stopped for a long time. Um, now, if you look at Intel, they do, pub, they do publish stuff right now on their FinFET where they claim they can run it at 0.7 volts. But you've got to be careful here, right? Because really what, deter what determines how low you can go with voltage is actually very complicated. So the one thing that determines how low you can go in voltage is your SRAM. So SRAMs are everywhere. I mean, it's not just that you get some SRAM chip. It, almost every product out there has SRAMs on it. And there's um, a component called Vmin, and I'll show you some plots later, where basically if you go below Vmin, you can no longer distinguish if you have a one or a zero. So you no longer have memory, okay? So what happens is because, and, and this V, and this V, um, the V, the Vmin in an SRAM is primarily set by the voltage variation. So the more voltage variation you have in a process technology, the higher the Vmin is going to be. I'll show you some plots on that later. So it's not to say that you can't run a transistor at 0.6 volts. Sure, you can. But the problem is if you cannot support a Vmin in your SRAM below, let's say, 0.9 volts, you can run your logic circuit at 0.7, but then you're going to need another voltage generator in order to run the SRAM at 0.9. And the problem with this is when you start adding multiple voltages onto chips, what happens is it starts taking up a lot of area, and area on silicon is very expensive. So most people don't want to do that. They want to run it at one voltage, and they don't want to have to deal with it. So voltage scaling is another big issue. Um, and this has been, this is, I would say this is probably the biggest issue right now because you've kind of hit this one volt wall. And I actually, I didn't put the slide into my presentation. There's, there's, I, I, I can send it to, to Anish and he can um, throw it up on the screen during your next lecture. But initially there was vacuum tubes, right? And then at some point in time, vacuum tubes just got too hot to operate. And then they switched to BJTs. And then BJTs were all the rage, and then eventually they got too power hungry. It's not, it's not so much the power, it's the power density. And the power density got too high, and then you switched to CMOS. And CMOS is actually at that point now where BJTs were 20 years, were basically 20 years ago. So what happens, the power density in these, in these chips is becoming so high that the system costs around the chip are just as expensive as the chip itself. So when I mean system costs, I mean things like packaging, right? If you look at a DRAM today, the silicon is a third of the price. A third of the price is testing the thing because you can't sell DRAM unless it's 99.9% you know, working. And the other third is actually packaging this. And if you go buy a DDR3 now or DDR4 when it comes out, at one stage you used to go buy a, you know, a DIM you used to put in your computer, it was a little board with, you could see the chips. Nowadays the thing looks, it's got all these fins on. Those are all heat sinks to basically dissipate the heat. This is how much power density is basically in these chips and it's a big problem. If you're Google, you go buy a server costs you two grand. It costs you two grand to run that server for the year because it's eating so, so, so much energy. So the system costs are actually becoming a very important part of basically IT spending. So this is a big issue that needs to be fixed. So, um, so where, where are we now? So I'm going to argue that, scale, that scaling began to break, physical scaling as I'll call it, at about the 130 node. And that stress and high K basically allowed you to basically go on for another four or five, five nodes. And then eventually, of course, you have to introduce some other type of architecture, which I'll get to in the slide, slide actually on the next slide. Um, Moore's law, I do believe that Moore's law up to the 28 nanometer node was, was valid. I do believe it, it has broken now because the cost of technology per transistor is actually increasing. Um, and then there's a massive need for um, basically innovation um, in the world of technology in order, for v in order for VDD scaling. And that need for innovation is becoming more and more urgent now because there's been a shift in the computing world over the last, it's not even that long, it's three or four years, right? Where everyone went from being plugged in with a laptop to basically holding their computer in their hand. So it's a fundamental shift. And if you want to see how big the shift is, all you have to do is basically go read up any... Um, you just go read an analyst remark about Intel, right? Intel's basically had this mindset the whole time of performance, performance, performance is king. And they completely missed the boat on the low power mobile market. 
And it's not that easy. It's not that easy to take that high performing device and to make it into a good device for low power and system one chip. It's very challenging. So where are we going to go from here? So basically, the four main things that I think are, are going to happen, there's going to be a lot of materials research. Um, personally, I'm not a believer in things like three, five channels. Um, we won't get into that now, but there's a lot of material research that needs to go on in contacting. So at one point in time, if you're looking at the 130 node, your channel resistance was probably 80% or 90% of your total resistance of your transistor. If you look at the 20 nanometer node, it's probably 50 or 60% of your resistance. So where's the majority of that resistance coming? It's actually coming in the resistance between the contact and the um, and the silicon, so it's the salicide resistance, right? So there's going to be a lot of research into those type, type of materials, and there, there already is now. I mean, companies are already thinking about going to different metals or different implants on the N and the P in order to basically lower the barrier to improve the external resistance. Lithography, you just had a talk on that the other day. This is a huge one, because basically, the next move to kind of reignite Moore's law is going to fall four, is going to 450 from 300. But it doesn't, you probably know more about this than me, but it almost doesn't make sense to go to 450 unless you have the EUV. Well, at least a lot of people say you need, you need both. So there's a lot of work going on on this. The other one is 3D packaging and TSVs. So do you guys familiar with TSV? through silicon via. So basically the idea here is you basically stack a whole bunch of dye together so you know you get this, the smaller form factor with just as much functionality. This is actually, uh, I had a conversation with someone in the DRAM market about this and what's interesting is it sounds great, it sounds like it's a, and I think things are going to go there but it's not going to happen anytime soon and, and the reason for this is when you're, especially in the DRAM market where I think TSVs or 3D packaging will you know, be ahead of the logic world. The problem there is once you put different dye together, you can't get them apart, right? So if you think about how you make money in the semiconductor industry, it's all about yield. Okay, so you run one wafer through the fab, if you can get every dye on that working, you're golden, right? Because you can sell them all. So the problem is when you start stacking these things, if you have one bad dye and you stack three or four, you chuck five, you know, all four of them away because once they're together, you can't get them apart. So there's a lot of challenges in moving here, and, and this is not saying it's not going to happen. I truly believe this will happen. I'm just trying to, talk, you know, basically tell you guys there's a ton of work going out there. It's just probably not where you think it is. It's not in traditional um, device technology. And the other one is uh, new device architectures. So that's mainly what this talk is about. Although I've used up a good chunk of my time going over the first part. All right. So what do you need to scale? So at least where we are right now. I, I'm going to look five, ten years away. I'm not interested. Well, I am interested, but not for this talk looking, you know, 20 years down the road when we've got some, you know, graphene structure or something. So for the next couple of years, what is required? It has to be a depleted device. Okay, and there's three types of depleted devices that are very, well, two that are very well known, and then the one we're working on, which I hope becomes very well known, and that's, of course, the FinFET, the FDSOI, and um, our DDC device. So why is it important to have a depleted device? So there's two things here. The first one is the top equa equation. There's this VT, this VT variation. So sources of VT variation are lineage roughness, um, the granularity of either the poly or the metal gate. Um, but the main one in advanced nodes is um, RDF or random dope and fluctuation, right? So if you think about a device which is 10 nanometers by 20 nanometers and you actually work out, you say you've got a large doping like 1 in 19, go do the math and you'll figure out it's a few atoms of doping, right? So as they reorder, or, you know, as they order themselves closer to the drain or closer to the source, it's random where they land up, you have a large VT vari variation and this makes design extremely difficult and it makes yield extremely difficult. So basically, how do you fix sigma VT? So the first one is tox. You can scale tox. All right, so you make tox smaller, it goes down. Well, I've already showed you, tox scaling is done, right? It's, it's not, it's not going to go anywhere. So the next thing basically is to get the doping out of the devices. And that's exactly what all three of those devices essentially do, is it takes what would be, let's say, the halo dose or a flat well dose and takes the, 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 you know, and takes the charger out of the channel. 
The other thing is um, short channel effects. I've put up uh, the equation, uh, simplified equation for swing over here, but it could be double, you, uh, they're all related to each other. And basically, how do you improve the swing or the double? Well, the one way is Seox. Again, you can make tox thinner, which increases Seox, which then gives you better swing. Or you can basically um, decrease the depletion capacitance, which means going to a depleted device.